Well, good evening, everybody. It's really lovely to see this many people here in person. I think this is the largest in-person event I've actually been to since my own inaugural lecture was in this room in January 2020. Um, so if some of you were there then, uh, welcome back. If you weren't, you can watch it online. Anyway, tonight is not about me. Uh, this is the Institute for Social Responsibilities flagship event. And my name is Jo Crotty. I'm Professor of Management here at Edge Hill, but I'm also the Director of the Institute for Social Responsibility, or as we call it, ISR. We set ISR up in September 2019 to bring together academics who are interested in looking at the concept of social responsibility from a multiplicity of different conceptual approaches and disciplines. And since then, we've put on, even in the last year, over 50 events and have more than 3,500 people join us on something. So I think by any measure, that is a success. One of the things we did this year as ISR is we took a lead on, on curating the university's Black History Month, and as part of that, we approached Dr. Onyeka Nubia to come and speak with us. He couldn't do it in the month of October, but as Black History Month is a contrivance, we said, no worries, you can come at a date to suit you. Maybe I stopped. And so, that's okay. <laughs> and so, this is our final event also, in addition to being our flagship event this evening, it's the final event in our Black History Month series. So, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Anya Kanubia is a pioneering and internationally recognised historian, writer and presenter who was reinventing our perceptions of British history, black studies and intersectionalism. And anyone who joined us this afternoon for the training will definitely say that is the case. I'm now rethinking everything I know about this. Onyeka is also a senior lecturer in history at the University of Nottingham and he has developed an entirely new strand of British history which includes Africans in ancient and medieval England and is an expert on Tudor England. He's also a visiting fellow here at Edge Hill University, the Director of Studies at Narrative Eye and can be seen on our screens at present on Channel 5 presenting the series Walking Victorian Britain. His lecture this evening has a different title on the website to the one that's on the screen, but this one I think is shorter, so I'm going to use that, and it's England's Other Countrymen. So I hand over to you, Onyeka. He's going to speak, and then I'm going to facilitate some Q&A. So I, I think that... Um, thank you ever so much uh, for that introduction. I think that the key thing to uh, begin, whenever we begin, I, is I'm... I'm struck sometimes when I come to institutions that I like to sort of find out what the overriding culture and um, the ethos of the institution is um, before I do a talk. But be it that I have a strong relationship here, I still did the same thing here, which usually means I come about an hour before uh, supposedly I'm supposed to be there. And sort of I like to sort of go to the library... Uh, walk around the campus, get a feel for the institution, um, just to see how, how the institution reacts towards me and um, how I react towards the institution without announcing anything, without being special, just by being me. And um, as a consequence of that, in some, some institutions and at some events, more than a handful, actually, over the years... I've actually been denied entrance to an event that I am the keynote speaker of. And then, and then of course, when eventually they do let me <laughs> stand up in front of people to talk, it's like, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So um, the idea of being um, special is temporal and transitory. And, um, and uh, as, as I'm just illustrating, it can equally, um, very quickly uh, diminish and you just become someone whose face uh, fits a certain description. So that's an experience um, that we have. And in the contrary way, the contrary way, uh, if, if it is contrary, although it's part of exceptionism too, is that when I, at Nottingham, there's quite a large first year about 400, more than 400 students uh, in, in the first year. And um, I take a lecture, now it's Tuesday morning, used to be Monday morning, in the main lecture theatre, about 
500 students and me at the front. Um, and the other students are walking past <laughs> who, who don't do history and uh, they're walking past. That's it. And you can see, uh, can you just have a quick look and then, <gasps> why, is he, why is he there? What's, what's he doing there? And then they press their faces up against the window. And as I'm talking, I slowly look and there's all these faces pressed trying to look in. Because it's so peculiar or seems so strange to them that they want to know who's doing this. You know, how, how can this be? It's such a, a strange thing for them. But it shouldn't be strange, but unfortunately it is. So within the concept of um, understanding Englishness and history, we are often bombarded with images of monarchs. These images of monarchs are then disseminated to us as the definitive representation of the period of time in which they exist in. For example, um, we need to diminish that fallacy. And the way we do it is by looking at this photograph, which is a picture of the present reigning monarch, longest serving monarch in British history now. And this picture does not, it does not provide a definitive description of the ethnicity of the country in which she has served. No, it is a photograph of the reigning monarch. We would, I hope, not disseminate this as an indication that Britain is monoethnic or that everybody in Britain looks like the monarch. I hope that we wouldn't. So why, therefore, do we allow ourselves the... <laughs> I was going to say laziness. It is actually laziness. The apathy to take an image of a monarch and say, OK, these images of monarchs and aristocracy provide the definitive definition of ethnicity in any period of time, any more than this image provides the definitive definition of the ethnicity at this period in time. It doesn't in either case. But it can help to facilitate an idea that there are some sacred white spaces that exist within English stroke British history. These sacred white spaces are either white on the basis of being emotionally so, our emotional attachment makes us want them to be sacred white spaces, or on the basis of ignorance or indifference on our part. However, have to have ownership here, we have to admit something. That historians have been reticent to explore the 2,000 year history of people of African descent inside the British Isles. Not only reticent, but in some ways, I'm trying to think of convenient words that I can use in this institution, um, that they have been rather slow in coming forward to actually reveal the evidence of this presence over a 2,000 year period. To such an extent that people think that to talk about such a thing is political correctness gone mad, or that they think that it's purely a matter of some kind of political agenda about destroying Englishness, which it is neither. It is actually a very, 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 very conservative narrative based on the evidence of this country's multi-ethnic past. So this um, idea of whiteness and blackness is very important because it helps us to deconstruct these notions. Whiteness and blackness are socially constructed normatives created from the societies in which um, uh, they arise. These are terms of art. Nobody is actually physically white. Nobody. It doesn't describe skin colour. It is a political and social construct about power and privilege and position and what have you. There are many people who are really blessed with menelin. And their skin is a rich, dark brown. But they are not uniformly black. Black does not describe their skin colour. Both terms are socially and politically constructed. And since both terms are, um, 
they are terms that we can choose to use or not use. Worse still, terms like red and yellow, which are used to describe ethnicity, have their root within the biological determinism of the science of race. There are not people with red skin. And there are not people with yellow skin. Neither term describes skin colour. These are politically, socially driven terms, um, uh, which we may in fact uh, choose not to use at all. Or we may choose to own and redirect in some way. But the point is that they are politically and socially driven. We should not assume that our predilection and misconceptions about ethnicity and race, and we have many within the 21st century modernity, are ideas and terms that arise originally from some other period of time. We like to blame everything that's wrong with us from the past. And we say that we're just a hostage to the past. We can't help it. We can't help being prejudiced. We can't help being Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, homophobic. We can't help it because it's the past. And we're just living out as legacies of the past. We're just children of the past. We can't help it. And we use these kinds of excuses, and they really are often, to explain modern racism. To explain it away. And we say, oh... Yeah, modern, uh, modern racism, modern anti-Semitism, it, 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 it's, it's, it's something from the past. But in fact, often, the way in which it manifests itself is entirely modern. And we are to blame, not the past. So be careful of putting everything in the past and blaming it on the past. Some things are and some things definitely are not. So, part of the problem also that we have is that now there is a sort of agenda, sort of, it's sort of there, about not wanting to appear prejudiced, right? Um, about wanting to say the right thing and, uh, uh, and to do the right thing, which is good. But that can mask a huge reservoir of confusions uh, 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 and ideas and problems. Um, and sometimes we want you, I want you, to actually say the thing that you don't think is politically correct, because that's the only way we get to explore it. That's the only way we get to investigate it, is if you boldly say, actually, I believe this. You know, actually, I believe that. And not for you to be immediately cancelled on the basis of what you say, of course, depending on what you say, but, but hopefully not for you to be immediately cancelled on it. That's the only way that we can work, is if you actually tell me what you think and what you feel even if it may slightly offend other people or even myself, because that's the way we get to tackle it. I don't want you to hide it somewhere. I want you to actually say it. And that's how we get to, um, to discuss it. So, yeah, having said that, um, we, we move on a bit and we try to conceptualise some terms, because since many of our ideas about identity aren't necessarily based on evidence but on emotion. Those ideas, since they're emotionally based, need something else emotionally to subvert them. And one can give an academic lecture, you know, like one of those lectures where the lecturer's written all their notes out, and then they stand up and they give, ah, blah, 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 some panel piece or, um, you know, for, for the tick the um, impact, tick the impact or the output um, box, but had no impact and no output in regards to the audience. You asked the audience, what did you actually learn from that? Well, it's a lot of long words, but I didn't actually learn anything. Because emotionally and by psychologically, we learn most of all visually. Visually. This is why we are going to see lots of images. This is to disrupt any emotional narratives that you may have. Okay, good. So, of course, this is a picture of the Mona Lisa that people <coughs> say renders issues regarding gender. This is the sort of image that is put out about Renaissance Europe. Um, uh, it, it's an idea that Renaissance Europe is sort of typified by this and Michelangelo's work, Leonardo da Vinci's work, etc., etc., um, uh, other work. Um, so, 
uh, David and, and what have you, and Shakespeare's works, these sorts of works are put forward as defining the European Renaissance. And from this, we might conclude that the Renaissance was a sacred white space. But then we see images like Caterina. And when we see images of Caterina, um, who is age 21 and servant um, to the Portugal's agent in Brussels, we then try and rationalise this image with that image. And sometimes in our minds to make sense of this image, and I see historians doing it, they say, oh, she was a slave. But her record, um, which describes the painting, just says, Caterina, age 21, servant to the Portugal's agent in Brussels. Brussels. It says nothing about being a slave. It says she's a servant to the ambassador working in Brussels. Why would we in the 21st century attach a negative inscription to a silver point engraving that has none of those negative inscriptions if we are truly free of 21st century or any kind of century prejudice. Surely we are laying the prejudice that we say we don't have in the 21st century on a period of time that we want to support our prejudices in the 21st century. But unfortunately, this image can't support our prejudice in the 21st century. Because the engraving has nothing of the sort attached to it. It's a silver point drawing of Caterina, age 21. There's no reference to her being enslaved. And no other records which support such a narrative. The silver point drawing, in fact, is drawn with humanity. It's one of Albert Dürer's least famous drawings least famous drawings now however in the time period in which it was done it was a bestseller many um artists of albert durer are <gasps> suddenly shocked and surprised when i present this image by albert durer it wasn't the only one that he drew of africans as if it's the first time that they've seen it these are 21st century art connoisseurs art historians of albert durer who are shocked by this image that they have never seen before and yet, in the 16th century when it was created, it was a bestseller. Again, I'm making a comment about 21st century prejudice. About us. Not about Albert Dürer. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, this is a um, uh, wonderful um, uh, picture. Uh, uh, created in the beginning of the 17th century. Um, it shows six artists of the Renaissance, um, uh, and one of them, if you note, is called Hegemont Indiana, the bottom one here. Yeah? Uh, and just to make sure, just in case some 21st century person says, oh, he isn't an artist, how do you know he's an artist? I mean, first of all, the name of the painting, the name of the drawing says that they are artists, and just in case, like the face on the Sphinx, just in case you had some doubt, He's actually holding a paintbrush. So he's the only one of the six holding a paintbrush, just in case some later person, perhaps, was, oh, he's not an artist. He's the only one who's holding a paintbrush. Yeah, you might call that postmodern revisionism. I don't know what we would call that. But anyway, so, so, so uh, it's a very interesting drawing. It's an interesting drawing because when you think of the Renaissance and you think of the artists of the Renaissance, you don't think that Africans could be the artists. You automatically may think that Africans were enslaved. The reason why you might think that Africans are entirely enslaved is because the inscription of enslavement has been placed upon Africans as a perpetual burden and a perpetual reference point that many people cannot emotionally escape from. Oh, were they slaves? Or was he a slave? Or, yes, he's an artist now, but was he a slave before? So, I understand why the question of enslavement is a perpetual stain on human history. I acknowledge that. But it is not the cornerstone on African diasporian history, African history in general, or even, dare I say it, British history. It's not. Um, it's a part, but it's not a cornerstone. It's certainly an important part, but not a cornerstone. So we shouldn't always use it as a reference point. So Hegemont Indiana deserves his place as a Renaissance artist. The Renaissance people that described him and drew him as one of the masters of the Renaissance Europe deserve us 
to recognize that they could recognize who the masters were and they could include this person of African descent. <laughs> yes. um, this is a, um, uh, a picture um, uh, a picture from the um, uh, uh, dating between the 15th and the uh, 16th century. It is a picture drawn from people living in the Iberian Peninsula. The Iberian Peninsula being the name given to what is now modern day Spain and Portugal. It is a picture um, that is often described as the Moors at play. Please let us note that these Moors are blessed with Menelin. He says, note this. It, it, um, unequivocally true. That they are blessed with Menelin. You're going to see lots of people who are actually blessed with Menelin today. Um, uh, and these are people who are blessed with Menelin. And yet, there are people, historians and others, who claim that the term Moor has no reference to ethnicity except that ethnicity as it relates to religion. And that therefore when people were called Moors, automatically are Muslim and automatically uh, they would be white, white in appearance, um, but nevertheless Muslim. Such a notion is anti the evidence that is against such an idea. Such an idea arises from a narrative structured from emotional history that would deny an African presence within Moorish history, deny the fact that Moors themselves refer to themselves um, as coming from North Africa, West Africa and Asia Minor, but the blackness that was being used to describe them was not only symbolic, politically, social and cultural, but was also related to a kind of idea about ethnicity, similar to what we now have, but in a very different way, and that it related to colour. The word more coming from moros, from the Greek and from the Latin words, uh, meaning black. And here they are, as Africans, um, with complexion, in the Iberian Peninsula, and being called Moors. And please let us note that they're playing chess. Also, if you would like to note, chess is an interesting game, of course, where white always moves first. Always. And yet people call it a game of equals. It's not. It's a game in which one side is the attacker, always the attacker, and one side is always the defender. One side is merely defending itself from an attack. It's not a game of equals. So... Chess um, became, um, it's interesting how our minds work though, uh, chess um, uh, became a game that was reintroduced into the Iberian Peninsula. I would never say that the Moors created it. It was reintroduced into the Iberian Peninsula by the Moors because they were studying European classical tra traditions as well as Far East traditions. Also, if we're looking at pigme pigmentocracy and colour complexion, one might note that the person who is serving is the one who is lightest of complexion, if you're into questions of pigmentocracy. Okay, um, uh, this is um, uh, an interesting thing because we just sort of need to explain uh, something. Um, there is an idea going around from anthropological circles and in certain historical sub circles that Africans are preliterate and produce no written word. You see august um, uh, institutions like this keep repeating these same narratives. Have you used no written word? There's no written scholars. It, it's an oral tradition on Yeka that, uh, that you mostly are looking for. It's an oral tradition. Uh, there, there, isn't, um, there aren't written works, um, etc. This is a kind of idea that is uh, promoted. And moreover, the, the renaissance that occurred uh, in Europe, even though I don't really like to use the term, but let's lose it, use it as a term of art, that the renaissance that occurred in Europe was entirely a European male affair uh, in which no other peoples of any cultures or ethnicities had any part. But, sort of just to counteract that fundamental uh, problem, in that if we look at history, we will see, uh, without a doubt... Do come in, do come in. Right there. Um, if we look at history, um, without a doubt, we will see that cultures and ethnicities are constantly connected to each other. There's no moment in time where Europe stopped being connected to Asia. 
because Europe is connected to Asia. There's no moment in time where Asia stopped being connected to the continent of Africa because they are connected to Africa. Africa is not an island. It's actually connected to the continent of Asia. And moreover, the continent of Africa is really, really close to the continent of Europe. Really, really close. That strait between the Iberian Peninsula and North Africa is shorter in distance than the English Channel is. So for us to assume that there wasn't ethnic interchange and that this ethnic interchange between the three continents hasn't been a continuous feature of human civilization would be a very ignorant and silly thing to believe. Okay, granted, the question of North America and South America is a slightly different story. Granted. But I'm not talking about those two continents at the moment, although there's a good deal of history to suggest that there were some interchanges. I'm talking about Asia, Europe and Africa. There is, in fact, a famous uh, drawing, which I haven't got today, which shows those three continents together, bound together as a sisterhood. It's a, it's a fantastic drawing, but I haven't got it today. But I have got this. Now, this is an interesting, um, um, interesting uh, citation. And I wonder if we can pick it. I wonder if our 21st century minds allow us to unpick this. This is a 16th century book or it's a citation for a 16th century book created in Venice in 1558 and it is a book written by Ptolemy right and it was written in Arabic before it was translated into Latin before it was then translated into the Venetian tongue now there's quite a lot there but I just want you to try to try and unpick what I've just said it was written in Arabic before it was translated into Latin, before being translated, in inverted commas, as the artist would say at that time, into a vulgar tongue, such as the Venetian language. It was written in Arabic first. Why on earth would it be written in Arabic first? It means, surely, that the scholar who read it in the ancient Greek language in which it was written, spoke and wrote in Arabic, and that's why they translated it into Arabic. And it could, in fact it does mean, that the translations of these texts in the 16th century were pivotal in the development of the Renaissance, and many of these translations were done in Arabic. And many of the scholars that did these translations were from North Africa, West Africa, and Asia Minor despite this notion that they are pre-literate. Okay, but this could be just an exception, isn't it? Just, just if one. Oh, playing too much on one, one text. Okay, we have another one. Aristotle, that philosophy is which superstitious work. Um, the work of Aristotle, written in Arabic, but from the Latin translation of the Arabic in 1519 in Rome. There are... Um, please don't take my word for it. Next time you go to the British Library, look at the 16th century Renaissance text. And look at places where people wouldn't ordinarily look at the beginning or at the title, which is often very, very, very long winded, but extraordinarily interesting. And you will often see that they were written in Arabic first, be it Aristotle or Plato or Socrates, you name it, Suetonius, written in Arabic first. The Lives of the Eminent um, Scholars, a brilliant work, very important work, written in Arabic first before being translated into Latin or European language, written and transcribed by an Arabic speaking or an Arabic writing um, uh, uh, writer before being translated into a European language. The Renaissance is not an entirely European affair. The Renaissance is connected to cultures and civilizations around the Mediterranean Sea, around the North Africa, uh, West Africa, and in Asia Minor. Europe, Asia, and the continent of Africa are inexplicably connected together and have been throughout human history, and they have each washed each other in cultures and identities, and even in terms of the interchange between each other um, uh, over the hundred um, over the thousands of years of human civilization. But I know it's hard to convince people on such matters. And simply by showing you two books and, and talking a little bit, it's not enough. These are books, books dating from the 8th century AD to the 16th century AD. These are books in West Africa, not even North Africa, where people can 
colloquially um, include within European civilizations, but in West Africa, in Timbuktu, yes, the civilization of Timbuktu, once civilization of Timbuktu, um, in what was the ancient kingdom of Songhai, a successor to Mali, a successor to ancient Ghana. These are collections of books because West Africa, especially kingdoms like Songhai, were most famous for their books. For their scholars who translated, yes, Greek and Latin texts and other texts into Arabic before being translated into other languages. Collections and collections of books, precious books, one of a kind books that tell us that the Renaissance or the idea of the Renaissance isn't, again, as I said, a purely European affair. And we should not dismiss Africans or any set of people as being pre-literate, even though there is, of course, an idea um, that being literate doesn't make you, inverted commas, civilised. We shouldn't dismiss people as being pre-literate, certainly if they are not. If they are literate, and we're saying that they're not literate, that's surely something quite terrible. Especially if the descendants of those people grow up saying, oh yes, we didn't have any literate culture. No, no, we, we, we were just oral. Because some professor has told them that this is the case and people write books that say this is the case. It really isn't that simple. So um, uh, this man, a wonderful man, is, um, is, is one of the curators of these texts. He looks after uh, these libraries that include these one, over 1,000 year old texts that are a fundamental aspect of human civilization and a fundamental repository for human civilization by which the rest of human civilization doesn't seem to care a jot about. One wonders why. One wonders why. Okay, so people of African um, uh, descent uh, don't come from just pre-literate civilizations. Uh, uh, and the kinds of people who would have been present in Europe are not people that automatically can be dismissed as being intellectually uh, or academically uh, naive, indifferent uh, or, or ignorant. Uh, and we shouldn't uh, think of that. Nor should we assume that these people automatically came in subservient roles. Um, the way in which these Africans are often portrayed uh, between the 8th and the 16th century is as conquerors. Sometimes this is for somewhat symbolic reasons, but based on some idea of ethnicity. Uh, uh, I love this um, picture um, because it shows um, the kinds of things that were happening in the period that some historians uh, foolishly call the Dark Ages, between the 8th, uh, between the 5th, um, and the 11th century. Uh, this was a period, of course, in which people of African descent, such as Gibral al-Tariq, that the Rock of Gibraltar is named after, um, entered um, uh, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, and these populations became resident populations in the Iberian Peninsula, France, and in this country, for the next four or five hundred years. Um, uh, the memory of these encounters are portrayed constantly in European heraldry, constantly, constantly. Uh, this is a 14th century uh, image uh, from Germany showing people of African descent as the Moorish population um, invading um, uh, Europe during the 8th century. Of course, we know in the Song of Roland, um, these representations of Africans are continuously displayed, even in a somewhat pejorative way, uh, in the Song of Roland, in the matter of France, um, uh, and in the matter of Britain, uh, including the Arthurian legends, which we'll come to. People of African descent also have a prominent role. So they, they are portrayed constantly um, uh, in um, uh, European heraldry and in European imagery, if only we would take the time to look. If only we would take the time to look. Of course, um, some of these people of African descent have a more central figure, a one of positivity, in which their blackness is celebrated as not only an aspect of their being, but a symbol of the unspotted, unblemished um, uh, perspective of the universe. This isn't my words. Uh, these are the words of um, uh, 
people of um, uh, white English descent living at the time who write about the unspotted purity of blackness um, and the unspotted uh, virtue of blackness. And we see this, um, this idea, this positive notion of blackness as a perpetual feature of European early modern society competing with any negative notions of blackness. We shouldn't take Shakespeare's word that the ideas that Shakespeare uses are the only ideas present in early modern society any more than we would take Quentin Tarantino as being the definitive description of 20th century American racial politics. For us to take um, uh, Quentin Tarantino's work as the definitive definition of 20th century American politics would be like taking Shakespeare as a definitive definition of early modern raceology or early modern ethnology. That would be a very um, foolish and foolhardy thing to do, and yet we do that. So, St. Morris is the patron saint of knights. I didn't misspeak. Not then, anyway. He's the patron saint of knights. He is portrayed constantly in early modern Europe heraldry. And he stands guard over Otto I, the Holy Roman Emperor's grave. Otto I was the most powerful man in Europe and the Holy Roman Emperor. And this man, unequivocally of African descent, the way he is de displayed and, it, and, and uh, shown in early modern uh, cosmology or early modern um, heraldry, is part and parcel of a deep-rooted belief in the perfection of the blackness and the possibility of the perfection of the blackness. Saint Morris, of course Morris is a play on word, Morris meaning black, and Morris from the, the blackness that we've just been talking about, was a Theban general put to death for not killing Christians uh, in, in, during the Roman period, but became in the early modern period a representation of the perfect knight. Yes, not St. George, but St. Morris. His birthday or his death day, depending on how you see it, is celebrated on the 1st of April. Yes, you know it, because we still celebrate it now, although we've forgotten it relates to St. Morris. And on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, as it's now called, people dress up in Morris attire, a word Morris meaning Moorish, Morris, 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 Moorish, um, Moorish attire, and sometimes blacken their faces wearing rings and bells around their wrists and ankles in a dance which celebrates St. Morris Day. The memory that it relates to St. Morris Day, the most popular day in the English calendar, before St. George's Day became the most popular day in the English calendar, has been forgotten. And the connection between Morris dancing and Moorish dancing and all of it being conflated with St. Morris Day has also been forgotten. So that we now say Morris Day is merely a symbolic thing and has nothing to do with Moorish people or St. Morris or any of it, when in fact it's connected to all of them and several other things as well, including cosmology. But we haven't got time to dwell on that. St. Morris is the patron saint of knights and he is respected throughout Europe. But I, I know, you may not believe it. So here is from the Czech Republic, not even Western Europe. We have a St. Morris, unequivocally a person of African descent, unequivocally a representation of the divine uh, and the divine nobility. These are representations from across Western Europe, as far east as Russia, as far west as Portugal, even when Portugal and Spain introduced Sangria Azul, even when um, uh, uh, Portugal and Spain, um, through the process of ethnic discrimination that became institutionalized, the representation of the black or African as having the potential of beauty, perfection and everything else, maintained itself as a constant feature within European society, competing with negative notions uh, or inscription uh, constantly uh, throughout the 14th, 15th and 16th century before disappearing in the 17th, at the end of the 17th and 18th century with the advance of the science of race, which removed those positive notions that existed um, in Europe um, regarding Africans, or mostly removed. Sometimes it's difficult to actually remove 
um, uh, the positive ideas. And just in case, because you might say, I know being cynical, not saying that you are, but you may well be, oh yeah, these are European countries, it's got nothing to do with England. So here we have from the 16th century, from St. Mary's Church in Ulfacombe, the image of St. Morris as this divine figure, just to tell you that England was part of the same thing. And here, uh, Matthias Grunwald to show you that these paintings and drawings of St. Morris aren't just obscure artists, because you might say, oh yeah, some obscure artists may have done that. But what about the masters? What about the Dutch masters? What about the Flemish masters? Have they, have they d d done St. Morris? Why haven't I come across them? Well, I don't know why you haven't come across them. But, but um, the, the Dutch artists and the French artists certainly did um, portray St. Morris as an African um, uh, in many cases. This one here is St. Morris disputing um, uh, with the Pope. St. Morris disputing with the Pope. There's actually some cosmological and anthropological and theological things that are behind that. But there isn't time to explore that uh, in the detail which it requires. It's to do with time, Alexandrian calendar and, and a, a Roman calendar and the, the, the preeminence of the Alexandrian calendar over the Roman calendar as a methodology of controlling Rome and the African um, uh, being a representation of the Alexandrian calendar. But we haven't got time to explore that in full detail. That's, that's for another um, session. Um, this is um, uh, from Saxony in Germany, showing St. Morris and the Theban Legion, um, 1520s. Um, again, showing them unequivocally as people of African descent. Um, uh, this again uh, in Germany, showing the Theban Legion, showing unequivocally of African descent. And this again, uh, showing the Theban Legion, St. Morris in the centre, uh, again from Germany in the 16th century. If we wanted to know um, the kinds of pictures in the 1930s and 1940s that those fascists found abhorrent, we might include these types of pictures and paintings because these pictures and painting painted a different image of Western Europe than the fascists wished to um, uh, portray. Uh, this is a wonderful um, picture of the Queen of Sheba, how she was depicted in 15th and 16th century European iconography, unequivocally a woman of African descent. So blessed with Menelin. So blessed with Menelin, one can only see the white of her eyes. Um, of course, this is bound up in the idea that the Queen of Sheba is the mother of Prester John. Some people believe that Prester John was located in the east, the far east, or was located in modern day Ethiopia. And since the Queen of Sheba was from what we might now call Sheba, which is in Yemen, the idea that Sheba and Prester John were connected. And we might think that it's ridiculous now, but Henry VII didn't. He wrote a letter. Uh, to Prester John, so he believed it was real, and he wrote to the Ethiopian king as if he was Prester John. And the Ethiopian king kept saying, why do I keep getting these letters from these Europeans to Prester John when I'm not? don't understand why. But anyway, certainly the idea that Sheba and Solomon or David, depending on how you see it, are connected wasn't entirely something that the kings of Ethiopia were backward in going forward in protesting. Because even they call themselves the descendants of the Solomonic line. The tribe of David, descendants of King David. You know, that, that's something that they used to talk about and claim. So it is not entirely as ridiculous a thing as we might assume. Not entirely a European um, Orientalist thing just put on these Africans. Actually, Africans did claim it when they wished to. Okay, but um, that isn't enough because we need to talk a little bit more about mythology uh, in that sense and how Africans were positive, could be positive representations um, uh, within English mythology. Uh, within the Bible, uh, the New Testament, there are the three wise men or magi who visit the baby Jesus. There is a constant pre... I don't know what quite the word is. Um, yeah, there is a constant positionality where the third of these three wise men is a person of African descent. It's a constant feature. And his name is Balthazar or Caspar, depending on how you see it. The conceit is that not only is a person of African descent, but that he is also youthful 
and full of energy. In this um, Rod Screen panel uh, in England, uh, 1520, let us note that Balthazar is dressed in an attire very akin to Henry VIII or someone of that nature. Modern attire. Let us note how different he is, how modern he is to the older Magi and how he has arrived last. He's the last one to arrive. But you might say, oh, this is by chance that he's dressed like this and he is arriving late. Surely it's not a constant feature of pictography. And if it is, what would it mean anyway? Um, uh, We have another by Hieronymus Bosch, a very famous artist of the Renaissance. Um, And Hieronymus Bosch, again, has a man of African descent and a young girl, which I think is his daughter, of African descent. And he has arrived last and... He is very, very youthful. And to emphasise his youth, he has his daughter. Both of them represent youth and vitality. In comparison, the other Magi are rather dishevelled, rather diminutive, and their attire seems um, rather dowdry. He is dressed resplendently in white, And he is without doubt the largest figure, though he is to the side, within um, uh, this picture. The poor baby Jesus looks like a rather poor, poor um, thing. One wonders if the child needs some sort of help. Um, If one sort of child like this we need considerable help. Um, um, Whereas the youthful African child is full of energy and vigour. But the child... The baby child here looks as if this child is in need of help. The Africans, as in the other pictures, have arrived last. And they are youthful and full of vitality. Oh, could it be by chance? This is just two paintings. Uh, Two paintings. And we have another one here. Altarpiece of the Adoration of the Magi. And it is in Sweden, just in case you thought it was only the countries where you've just been mentioned is found across Europe. He is even more youthful, beardless. And again, he has arrived late. He has arrived late. Yeah. We have another um, uh, um, uh, from the workshop of the master um, uh, in Poland, uh, 15th century. And again, the, man, the young man of African descent, he is a very young man, arrives late. And again, is the youthful uh, representation. Why could this be? This is not just by chance. When you see this systemically um, portrayed. Um, but for a long time, my 21st century ideas couldn't allow me to decipher what I was actually seeing. Because my mind was preoccupied with 21st century or modern ideas. Though I might not claim that it was. I was trying to think, oh, is he a slave? And, and, or is he this? Or is he being excluded? No, he's not being excluded. He is arriving last. He is like today. No disrespect to anybody who arrived late. If we're all sitting here and somebody arrives, we stop and have a look. Because this is a new person that's come in. They become the centre of attention. The central figure. I don't want to let's go back again just to show you. In each of these drawings, the African becomes the central figure. Look at this. Please let us look at this carefully. The African is the central figure. He may not be here, but he's certainly the youthful representation of something. And he may not be here, but he's certainly the youthful representation of something. Now these Renaissance artists aren't bound by political correctness. They don't have to make him like this. They don't have to make him youthful and beard, beard, unbeardless. They don't have to make him uh, the, the centre of attention if they don't want to. They have chosen to do this because it represents something about how they saw Africans within the religion. That something is um, a little bit beyond um, what we can examine. But the something is positive. And when we put an automatic negative inscription on it, we are overlaying our 21st century ideas, uh, when in fact um, they are misapplied. So all of this mythology and um, theology and ideas uh, about Africans and about blackness, 
um, are living in a field of ideas within European thought processes throughout the 14th, 15th and 16th and early 17th century. And they don't obscure a real African presence. Let's stop talking about Othello. Othello is fictional. Othello is a fictional character. Right? He's a fictional character. He's interesting, nevertheless, but he's a fictional character. The people that we're going to be talking about now are real people who lived in this country. Some of them were born in this country, baptized in this country, and some of them died in this country. So, one of those individuals was Deirdre Joanqua, uh, baptized um, uh, part of the king's son, um, Guinea. Guinea here, a generic term describing uh, a rather generic um, uh, description of West Africa or the West African coast, depending on how you see it. So John Joranqua, the king's son from Guinea, baptized 1st of January, 16, 1610. Dear Joranqua, probably 1611 actually, um, bearing in mind that they believe that the year came to an end in March, or some believe that. So sometimes when they write the record, they say 1610-11. So we can roughly guarantee that it's 1611. When I looked at the original record, um, it was mostly... Uh, suggesting that it was 1611 and not 1610. But I put both in just in case. Deirdre Joanqua was 20 years the son of Cadiba, king of the river says. That means when he came to this country, he was 20 years old. And he was baptised in, in, um, uh, in St Mildred's Poultry in London. And he came in a ship called the Abigail of London. That's quite a lot of information. He's from West Africa. He was the son of Cadiba, King of the, it's actually a city, uh, or was at the time, um, called Cestus in the country of Guinea. Guinea is not a country we now know. It's actually a region. And he was sent by his father to come to England to be baptised. Why? Why? Uh, uh, people often um, uh, try and find some post-colonial notion to make sense of it, when actually um, post-colonial notions don't make sense of this history not really um, but in order to explain this we need to talk about another entry which is very similar um, this is for Walter Nanaberry um, the son of Nossa Nanaberry born in the kingdom of Dunkwala uh, Dunkwala in West Africa was baptized on the third day of February being Shrove Sunday in the year of King James uh, in All Hallows Tottenham he was baptized in Tottenham in Harringay London at uh, 1610 um, now sorry 1611 as it were now Walter Nanaberry, um, the son of Nossa Nanaberry, and Deirdre Joanqua are both in England at the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century as a result of West African overtures. West African overtures. Because something terrible had happened, which relates to the matters that we've just been talking about at the beginning. Which is that in 1591, 1593, the Kingdom of Morocco waged war on the Kingdom of Songhai. And the Moroccans were supported by the Ottoman Empire, English mercenaries and Spanish mercenaries. The Kingdom of Songhai, which was the largest kingdom in West Africa, roughly the size of Western Europe. I'll just repeat that. Roughly the size of Western Europe. The Kingdom of Songhai was defeated, roundly defeated, and the manner of its defeat caused a shockwave through West African politics. We would find this if actually we did any research on West African politics, but few of us do. And this shockwave within West African politics, since the Ottomans and the Moroccans defeated the Kingdom of Songhai using gunpowder and guns, caused West African kingdoms to seek European and in some cases Ottoman support in order to defend themselves against potential colonialism from the East or from Spain and Portugal. So this matter does relate to colonialism but not the colonialism that we're thinking about. And it shows an ownership of a political diplomatic overture that we have somehow forgotten which is west african leadership seeking european aid seeking european aid uh, we seem to be willing to acknowledge that the moroccan um uh, leadership 
uh, was able and capable of seeking diplomatic overtures with Queen Elizabeth or the Ottomans or whomever. We seem willing to do that, but not willing to accept that West African leadership, East African leadership or Southern African leadership was capable of such overtures. That's because of our some of our notions of biological determinism and, and, and scientific racism that we say we don't have, where we still think that people from West Africa uh, and East Africa, well, certainly from West Africa, had no civilization. You know the term, the Negro has no civilization, an idea that was proposed as a methodology to justify enslavement of African people, especially those from West Africa, to say that West African civilization did not exist. And therefore, this is why I emphasize West African interaction. Not to say that there are other African interactions. Of course there are. But I emphasize West African interactions because there is this idea that West Africa had no civilization. Yeah? Okay, good. So, in England, not only these ideas of, 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 uh, uh, of blackness and positivity could be attached to real people of African descent um, uh, in a kind of general term, but in a specific term. Uh, I have no doubt that some of you are aware, I hope so, that the King of Scotland, King James IV of Scotland, conducted events known as the Romance of the Black Lady or the um, Celebration of the Wild Knight, where he dressed as a black knight. And some people say, well, the black knight is surely a symbolic kind of blackness. This idea of the black knight is a symbolic kind of blackness, and this blackness does not relate to being African or you know anybody of African descent. It, it can't relate, surely. Surely you, you can't get that. But just bear with me, please. I don't, I don't know how much time we have. Uh, bear with me, please. The, this romance involved um, King James IV wearing the armour of a black knight and then serenading these two women... Uh, one called um, Anne Moore, um, and one called, uh, one called Black Margaret, um, termed Black Margaret, another called Ellen Moore, both of them uh, referenced by their Africanness. These two women were brought to Scotland by Andrew Barton of Over Barton, who actually kidnapped them from a Spanish or Iberian ship and brought them to Scotland, where they were serenaded as an example of beauty and perfection, not just Orientalism, as some people might say. Not only that, not only was King James IV dressing up as a black knight and serenading these two African women, but the events portrayed were organised by Peter de Maurien, or Maurien, an African drama stroke event planner who was continuously employed in Scottish um, treasury, um, uh, as evidenced by Scottish treasury records, from the middle part of the 1500s all the way until 1514. These are the records of his um, constant employment and constant payment. Uh, I think all of this kind of uh, interaction of people of African descent in the Scottish court must have made some members of the Scottish court rather, rather angry. Right? That's not speculation. That's not speculation. Because some of you may well know that there is that famous poem. The famous poem called Anne Blackmore in which William Dunbar, Scottish poet laird or whatever, um, writes this terribly um, uh, uh, description of this African woman. Um, and I think partially it's because of the jealousy of having these people in the African court. So these people, yeah, in the African court, in the Scottish court. Okay, so Peter the Morian, or Morian, um, you might say, well, what does that name mean? It just means more, doesn't it? No, it doesn't mean just that. Morien is a name of a person, a person from the matter of Britain, from Arthurian legendarium. He was a knight of King Arthur, and he came from Moorish lands. Uh, his mother also came from Moorish lands. He comes to England as part of the legends of King Arthur that we've uh, actually forgotten, and the Romance of Morian is a 13th century European legend um, written in France and part of the, um, the, the matters of France. <clears throat> Morian is a constant feature of the Arthurian legends. Constant feature. And he is described as being black, um, all black, black as a raven. He is the original black knight. 
just in case you were wondering why I said um, this reference to Black Knight. He is the original Black Knight, whose blackness is represented by his armour, and the wearing of his armour is a representation of his blackness. <laughs> he is depicted constantly as a person of African descent. Uh, this is from Mantua, in what is now modern-day Italy, uh, saying um, uh, St. Morian, etc., Okay, away from uh, some of the mythology, um, what do people actually say in England about English ethnicity? And is it different from what we now say? Most of the people like Venerable Bede say that they are unable to talk about or prove who are the indigenous. We seem to have, have a kind of notion now where we say, yeah, we can prove it. We know who's indigenous, can we? We can prove the first, what the first people looked like who lived in these isles. Can we prove... Can we prove what the first people who lived in these islands looked like? Shall I just ask the question again? Just in case you say. Can we prove what the first people who lived in these islands looked like? I think not. I think not. And these early English writers are not backwards and going forwards in saying that we cannot prove it. Venerable Bede, Richard Simon, Sester, Francis Bacon, say the same thing. These are quite learned peoples. Who say the original inhabitants, are, whether indigenous or foreign, are like most other countries, unknown. Unknown. They don't know who. In other words, they're saying it's not them. Sorry, those of you who believed in an Anglo-Saxon hegemony and wanted that to be the original thing. Um, uh, most um, early modern medieval and, and classical writers don't share your enthusiasm for that kind of monoethnic continuity. It seems to be more complicated than that. It's certainly not monoethnic. Even Anglo-Saxon isn't monoethnic by its uh, definition. Um, so Africans came to England not just in the early modern period, but as a result of many different um, activities. Africans were part of the Iberian, wider Iberian population uh, within Europe uh, during the 8th to the 5th century CE. Africans came with the Romans and from 55 BC um, all the way to 475. They came with the elephants. It, when Claudius came in 43 AD, the elephants didn't swim across the Mediterranean Sea. They came with their trainers from Africa. As far as I know, there aren't any elephants in Europe. Certainly there weren't in 43 AD. They had to come either way from Asia or from Africa, and these elephants came from the continent of Africa, and they came with their trainers. It's very logical when one thinks about it. Um, uh, in 43 AD, Africans came with the Vandals from North Africa in 450 CE. And Africans came with the Vikings, yes, during the Danish raids from 700 CE onwards. And then they are displayed occasionally um, and sometimes um, uh, periodically in English records. This is from the Doomsday Abravito book. Not the Doomsday book, but the Doomsday Abravito of 1241, showing an African holding on to the letter I... Uh, this is a uh, wonderful 11th century image of an African knight and a white English lady. Uh, uh, this is a wonderful thing, just illustrating the very thing that I was talking about but a thousand years later, showing this man here is a man of African descent. This is a 13th century representation. Um, there is some, some, desire to record his ethnicity, hair texture and what have you, but no overriding desire to emphasise it. And he is the person that is controlling the elephant. Good, good. Um, okay, so Africans have been a continuous presence. It's not just uh, during the Renaissance um, that, they, that they suddenly arrived. Um, this is a wonderful record, and I wonder if we can look at this and try and decipher it from our thought process. It says, James Cuddy's being a more Christian and Margaret Person a maid. This is a marriage. The word more here clearly does not reference religion. He's not a Muslim Christian. That would be an oxymoron or a paradox in two words. He is a more Christian. The word more here is referencing something other in this case and in many other cases, a religion. It is referencing 
other things related to ethnicity, one of them being ethnic origin, skin complexion, and what have you. And it is showing something that is a constant feature of many of these records, the ethnic interchange between people of African descent and people of white English descent, being married, having children, having children, having grandchildren and great-grandchildren in this country. And this is one of those records yeah, showing that these unions were relatively frequent. I say relatively. Yeah? I'm not saying everywhere uh, um, uh, that they took place. I said relatively frequent. Frequent enough for people to comment on it. Frequent enough, actually, people like George Best in 1578 to actually get offended by it. Uh, in, and just to illustrate, this is not just London. In Plymouth, Helen, daughter of Christian, the Negro servant. This is the first time we've heard this term. Uh, because the term Negro was a term that came in from the Spanish use. The word more and, um, and uh, uh, more awesome, what have you, were the more original terms to describe ethnicity. So this is Helen, daughter of Christian, a Negro servant to Richard Shear. The supposed father being Cuthbert Holman, illegitimate. Uh, baptised in St. Andrews in Plymouth, uh, 1594. In Bristol, this is an interesting one, Joanne Pointing, the wife of Thomas Pointing, being a Blackamoor. In fact, it is Joanne Pointing who is the Blackamoor, not Thomas Pointing. I was very confused by this until I saw uh, more um, references um, to this. In Bristol, uh, 1603, uh, Domingo here, a black Negro servant, until Sir William Winter, buried 27th of August of consumption. These people aren't being expelled or deported, how some people might um, uh, like to describe it. They are mostly dying of natural or unnatural causes, the same unnatural causes that everybody else was dying from. Things like smallpox, um, consumption. A lot of people die of the bubonic plague. A lot of these people of African descent are dying of people because many of them are within the working and lower class populations. Why? Because most of the population is lower and working class, not because specifically they've been bound there in terms of race. It's not as simple as that. Um, so Domingo uh, was um, buried um, with the best cloth on the 27th day of August, 1587. And he had consumption. Um, Simon Valencia... Because he was from Valencia, a black and more buried, 20th of August, 1593. He was a servant to Stephen Driffield, a needlemaker. He was probably a needlemaker too. And Anne Vassy, or Vassy, a black and more wife to Anthony Vassy, champion of the said country. I often get students to try and work out what this entry is about. But since we don't have time for you to pontificate on it, um, this, this said country is a reference to ethnicity. It is saying that she and he are both blackamoors. It's a way of saying that they're both blackamoors in a kind of roundabout, roundabout early 17th century English way. This is the record for Mary Phyllis of Morosco. Mary Phyllis being 20 years old, uh, uh, servant to Mistress Barker in Mark Lane, uh, a widow. And it talks about her and her father, Phyllis of Morosco, being a basket maker and shovel maker. This is a very long entry. It talks about how she came to this country 10 years ago. Sorry, 13 years ago. My mistake. Sorry, Mary. 13 or 14 years ago. And that she was 20 years old. And that she was a servant with Millicent Porter. The record is a very, 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 very long entry. The longest entry of any for a commoner in the 3rd of June, 1597. And yet the one or two people, because it's only that... The one or two people who've actually written books that include her, and it is only one or two people, those one or two people still try and make out that she's a slave. When it says everything else but that, it says quite clearly, Mary Phyllis being a Blackamoor, oh, sorry, yeah, Mary Phyllis, oh, sorry, let me, Mary Phyllis being a Blackamoor was the, um, uh, the daughter of Phyllis of Morosco being both a basket maker and a shovel maker. And it's quite clear that she's not someone um, who's enslaved. And yet we, and yet we um, uh, like to put that on that person. So 
21st century prejudice makes us not see English history for what it is or see diversity for what it is. Um, and yet we might feel that we're being so politically correct. <laughs> you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater and then claim that we haven't. Um, yeah, so this is a, uh, a record for um, uh, an African, um, uh, a needle maker, sorry, yeah, a, a needle maker. This African was the first person to develop Spanish needles in England. You would think that um, uh, we would remember that, since the Spanish needle was so much a part of English history and the development of uh, uh, the industry that revolutionised that revolutionized, uh, industrial development uh, in this country and elsewhere. And uh, we'd be right in assuming that this person of African descent would be remembered in his lifetime or thereabouts. William Harrison in 1577 says Spanish needles were first taught in England by uh, Elias de Grasse. But on the eighth year of Queen Elizabeth and Queen Elizabeth, there was a Negro made fine Spanish needles in Cheesa, but would never teach his art to any. This African, who is very important to English history and very important to the industry in which he is part of, is continuously talked about throughout the end of the 16th and the early 17th century. He is continuously recorded in Hayden's Dictionary. It says, Needles were first made in England in Island by a Negro from Spain, but was lost after, at his death. And Thomas Fuller, early uh, 17th century, says, The first Spanish needles in England were made in the reign of Queen Mary in Cheapside by a Negro, but such is envy. Let's not get too caught up on the word Negro. He's talking about Africans, or a particular African. This, the word more here may be a bit of a joke, actually, um, that, he's, that he's saying, knowing that the word Negro is there. Uh, that, that's another matter. But the point is that this African is constantly in, described within English history. And it is only within modern history that we get amnesia about him. Be careful of us putting our prejudices on the past automatically. Uh, this is John Blank, shown twice on the Westminster Tournament of 1511. Showing going to and from. This is him coming from, wearing a green turban laced with silver. I won't spend too much time with him because I presume that you can find out stuff about him. He's kind of well known now. Wasn't 20 years ago, but is now. This is the payment to John Blank, which you may not know. Please let us know. Item to John Blank, the black trumpeteer, just in case you were in doubt. Uh, and this is a, uh, uh, a wonderful um, painting. Uh, it says three boys. It doesn't say two boys and a slave. It says three boys. Um, uh, 1670, uh, Dulles Picture Gallery. It was there. I don't know if it still is. Um, fantastic painting. Fantastic painting. And yet, often when I show this painting, someone comes along just to try, if they can, to make an idea that this person is. They say, well, he's begging. He's putting his hand out. No, he's not. He's exchanging pie for some kind of drink, I think, probably wine. This is an exchange taking place. And he's a central figure, if we know anything about Renaissance pictography. He is the central figure, though the young man on the bottom is looking at us. These are three young boys in some discourse. There is no influence I can see to the African boy being inferior to them, unless we put that inscription on them automatically. Although our 21st century minds and everything that has happened in relation to Africans may want us to put that inscription on them, on him, when the artist has just named it three boys. So um, uh, this is another um, uh, painting uh, that for a long time I couldn't figure out what was going on. It's an interesting painting uh, because it shows uh, some kind of communal interchange. Familial interchange between two young people um, of a familiar nature. It is suggestive. The young um, uh, girl is looking at us whilst receiving fertility symbols of these young birds. The young boy is smiling earnestly as he gives um, to the young girl uh, these fertility symbols. And we as an audience are spectators in this interchange. Can we make sense of it with our 21st century eyes? So we we'll say, oh, he's surely, surely he's inferior. Well, there's, no, there's, there's no reference to inferior. This is not 
the original inscription of the painting. We don't know what the original title was, unfortunately. We see an interchange between two young people. This is not naivety. It's not naivety to see that. Some of that open perspective we need. Because the overlaying prescription that we've placed on early modern English history actually blinds us to the complexity of interchange, of intersectional interchange that may have existed in English society prior to, the, um, uh, prior to the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th and the 19th century and biological determinism and everything else. I, for a time, couldn't figure out what was going on in this painting and then I realised because of the research that I'd done that, in fact, they could be cousins because the Smythe family married, into pe- married and had people of African descent within their bloodlines. So... the. Uh, the, the, the key thing um, in the time that I um, have, which isn't very much time, um, uh, the time that I have, which isn't very much time, is that I cannot for you, um, I cannot for you overlay, um, I cannot overlay and undo in the time that I have, everything that has been done to you psychologically and mentally regarding this matter. All I can say is that it's more complicated than simple narratives. And anybody that offers you a simple narrative, especially on English history, is probably trying to mislead you. It's probably trying to mislead you. If they offer you simple monoethnic narratives. I have not done so today. I've not offered you simple narratives. I've offered you alternative perspectives than ones which you probably are familiar with. I've done that so that you might understand that there are lots of narratives on English ethnicity and and narratives on English um, identity. But what is certain that the mono-ethnic narrative that has hitherto been postulated and given to you is a narrative that is unsupported with evidence. Thank you. Right, well, thank you very much. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions, or are you all now standing to silence? <laughs> I'm hoping there are questions. I'll come back with the microphone. I'm a bit out of practice with running with the microphone. Oh, you've got us. Well, first of all, thank you. I really enjoyed everything you had to say this evening. And it's made me think about a lot of things I hadn't thought about in the past. But one of the things that sprung to mind, particularly when you were showing the um, Magi, is it? Is that the, the, there was a lot of repetition throughout those images. And part of me was thinking, is that due to the fact that you get a lot of repetition throughout imagery, regardless of how it's produced? Because one inspires another, inspires another, and it's almost like a reinforcement of a message. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. So it was more, so I know that it was maybe presented as these were all the different places where these particular images were seen, but it, one could have seen another and then inspired a chain of events. Yeah, I, I think um, it's a fantastic question. I think it's more than just pictographic inspiration, although I do agree that that's all part of it. It's actually related to an, a European idea that seems to have been lost, a European idea in which Europeans were capable of seeing blackness and the identity of blackness as having noble and spiritual aspects. Yes? Um, yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> also, just wanted to say thank you as well. Um, sort of following on from that, I wondered if perhaps the reason he was such a central figure is that he was representing the third gift of myrrh. Because obviously if Jesus hadn't had a sacrifice, the rest of the gifts are irrelevant. So if anything, the third magi might be the most important. So I was wondering if that's kind of what they were trying to represent. Yeah, absolutely. And also the Alexandrian calendar that, that I just keep mentioning to you. 
the Alexandrian calendar. There's this dispute over which calendar should be followed, the Alexandrian or the Roman. The Alexandrian calendar seems to be represented by St. Augustine of Hippo um, and others, uh, the North African fathers. And these North African fathers are often portrayed as Africans, and therefore these African symbols are sort of representations of these African fathers. It's a way of sneaking them in to caricature and portraiture. So in a way they are symbolic, but not symbolic in the way in which we might think. Yeah. Thanks so much. It's been great. Just to say I work a little bit with the PREVENT programme and last week in the paper it was published that for the first time um, hard right extremism has outnumbered Islamic extremism in the PREVENT intervention process. Um, how do we put the message out about what you've just been talking about more strongly and work against that? Oh, thank, thank you. That's a, a, a great question. I'm difficult. Yeah, but we've all been misled. Uh, sometimes we're misled by people who don't know any better and they mislead on the basis of not knowing. I, I wasn't taught any of this history uh, at all. Um, I, I, I don't want you to think that I fell from the sky. Um, I didn't. I was born here. Uh, I've lived here all my life, most of my life anyway. Um, and I was taught I had no part to play in this society and that the overriding history of interactions between people of white European descent and African descent was automatically one of hostility in which the African uh, was the defeated one. I was always taught that that was the narrative of history and that that could be stretched back as far as you would go in terms of uh, interrelations. And um, this idea was then reinforced through post-colonialism, sometimes unfortunately, that that was all the automatic uh, resin that, uh, that was the way in which uh, people interacted. And therefore that, you know, the first uh, people of African Caribbean descent arrived on the Empire of Windrush. I never believed that, but certainly people said that. And if, therefore, the first people of African Caribbean de descent arrived on the Empire of Windrush in 1948, what are they doing here now? Uh, uh, and surely England was better and great when all those peoples uh, weren't here. Um, uh, that kind of notion is an idea that might then come. So, but that, these kinds of ideas exist because the history, History and historiography of exploring British history is a neglected field. People might say, well, what are you talking about, Onyeka? Uh, I, I saw just recently another, another film on Henry VIII or another documentary on Anne Boleyn or, 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 or another you know, Merchant Ivory production on Queen Anne. What are you talking about? That, 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 that British history is neglected. Uh, that's my point. Um, British history is a neglected field of study. Um, the, um, uh, British history, English history is a neglected field of study, but the study of elites within English and British history isn't a neglected field of study. Um, I like Richard Burton very much, but I don't need to see another film of Henry VIII and, um, and, and uh, the Anne of a Thousand Days. I like Richard Burton. He's one of my favourite actors. I don't need to see another Henry VIII film. I really don't. Um, but because of that, the notions of ethnicity that lie within our emotional understanding are a monoethnic white British society and there is an idea that Britain then was better than it is now and that the problems that we now have are a result of inter-ethnicity inter and diversity and this has caused all of our problems right and so the blame gets put on a minority population who is supposed to have recently come Right? And that when, British, when Britain was great, which is another very foolish notion, but when Britain was great, then it was great because it was monoethnically white. And that these sorts of narratives, though they're not based on any evidence, are based on an emotional belief. And the emotional belief is stronger than the narrative often that is based on evidence because that um, other narrative often isn't delivered with emotion. Right? It is often delivered with an apology. Right? And, and it goes in one ear and out the other. Oh, that was just political correctness, wasn't it? Yeah. No! Actually, you were politically incorrect. It's not that this was political correctness. You were politically incorrect and historically incorrect and evidentially incorrect and incorrect in every way. But I know why people would emotionally hold on to a monoethnic idea. 
They would do it because, especially if you're in suffering, as people have been suffering in this country for a very, very, very long time. Right? And this suffering that people feel economically, socially, in the most deprived areas of this country is a, is a crying shame that we have so much um, um, poverty um, and so much um, economic suffering in this country that's supposed to be so successful. This suffering, people need or they feel they need a scapegoat. They need to blame somebody for it. They have to blame somebody for it. And it is easy to blame visible minorities. It's very easy. And to explain away the suffering that one may feel on a visible minority of any kind, of any kind, of any kind. Um, but it doesn't resolve the problem, which is more deep-rooted. I think we have two, one, one, two, um, and then we're going to run out of time. I think we could stay here all night, probably. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, my question is, you've mentioned a few times about emotion, yes. emotion history. Yes. I wonder whether you could expand on that a little bit about the way in which emotion history has been, for want of a better word, raced, as well as, of course, gendered, and um, yeah. whether you could expand on that a bit. Yes, the, the, the difficulty is that um, uh, we are emotional beings, uh, we are uh, emotional beings. Uh, we are not just logical automatons. We're not machines. And if something is delivered with emotion, it resonates with us far more than perhaps the sensible idea given to us in that pedestrian way. Traditionally, monoethnic history has been delivered with a passionate emotional position even though it's unsupported by evidence worse still academics who should know better have continued narratives and these um, narratives can be on the left or the right this is not a political matter because the people on the left do it just as much with post-colonialism and everything else they obscure um, uh, um, the diversity that we've been talking about or they constantly refer to it through a post-colonial lens defining those people automatically as inferior downtrodden and what have you without the evidence to support it I know why they would do that but it's equally as wrong as those who know about this presence and ignore it for mono-ethnic reasons so whether they're on the left or the right or whatever they are they still have ignored the history that we've just been talking about this happens this happens because it is safer to be within the academy than to be outside of it. And if the academy is directed a certain way, in order for you to function as an academic within it, then you function as an academic repeating the same narratives. After all, your, mark, your essay has to get marked. Your, your PhD has to get judged. You, you have to go through the system. And, and if the, nobody understands what you're talking about, how can you go through the system? So the question of emotional um, understanding isn't just a class issue. It's not as if all oh, there's these terrible people out there uh, and they don't want to know this history. It is also those people that want to know, oh sorry, those people that claim that they want to know but don't really want to know. They only want to confirm what their narrative already is. And emotionally they might have a large stake in only wanting to prove what they already know. They are not interested. And every time I'm, I'm, I come to one of these lectures or, or, or I'm doing one of these lectures, and I, I've been doing these for some time now, um, some time now, there's always one or two lecturers and it touches them so deep inside. The wound that I never meant to cause, I never meant to cause, touches them so deep because they may have built their whole academic career on a narrative without evidence. And they are emotionally attached to this narrative. And then who am I to come and say a narrative? And it is worse still because it's not as if me, I am telling them something. It's because they know after only listening to a few moments, oh my God, I've got to 
think about these things differently. And I've been thinking about this for 20 or 30 years. I got my PhD on this. I got blah, 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 blah. For emotionally, for them, it can be really traumatic. So the question of emotion isn't just um, the people that we might classify as usual suspects. It's almost everybody. Almost everybody. And no, of, of, no matter what ethnicity they are too. Uh, people of African descent. You say, you're trying to take away our pain. You're trying to take away our pain. This country has done terrible things to Africans. I agree, it has. Um, but you can't blame this period of time because that's not what was happening in the way in which you claim. I'm not taking away your pain, I'm contextualising it. And you can't use this period to justify what you think you can justify. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Hi, I'd like to ask you a question about the word race and the vocabulary of, of race because it's a construct and a concept that I've had to learn and it's not something that's part of how I see things. And you started in the lecture by talking about, about race and about the, the vocabulary of race. Yes. And I just wondered what, uh, I've noticed in your lecture some of the vocabulary that you've used and I just wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about the vocabulary you use okay. instead of using this concept and yeah. construct of race. Oh, absolutely. So, so I, I tend not to use the word race, um, even though I know it's a socially constructed phenomenon, because it's too related, as far as I'm concerned, to the science of race and biological determinism. You know, Carl Linnaeus and uh, Frederick Blumenbach. No? I'm not. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, people like Carl Linnaeus... And Johann Frederick Blumenbach. Usually academics ask that question. Oh, sorry, okay. sorry, I didn't want to presume. Uh, but people like Carl Linnaeus, John, uh, Johann Frederick Blumenbach, and Francis Galton, you know, the questions of eugenics that come on later on. Uh, these notions um, of race tend to be uh, related to that, right? That kind of science of race, biological determinism that works within the science of race. And so often when you talk about race, you kind of by default, are including all of that. And if you don't contextualise how you're using race, people will presume the biological determinism and that you are adhering to it, which you certainly, which is difficult to adhere to because there's lack of evidence to support it. So that's the problem with using race. But you can be greatly, greatly misunderstood in this country. In the American scenario, it's different because there is a history of laws which are specifically racially bound. And therefore, in talking about the historiography of race, it has a footprint which is definable and explainable. The question of ethnicity in Britain, but not within British colonial and empire, in, in the colonies and empire, it's different. We can talk about race in specific terms because the British were very good in exporting a notion of race to the Caribbean, to North America, to South America, to the continent of Africa and to Asia without necessarily implementing that concept of race within racially stratified terms in this country. Probably at no moment within this country. Uh, not in the open terms that people may think. Uh, probably at no moment. Um, and so therefore it is much clearer when talking about the intersectional nature of ethnic relations within this country to talk about ethnicity because ethnicity is a far broader term, although by no means is it a good one. But it's a little better. It's, sorry, my mistake, it's not a little better. It's actually a very bad term. But it's, it, it is not as bad as race. Yeah? It's not a good term, but it's not as bad as race. Uh, ethnicity has a little bit more space in it, even though it's not a very good term. Whereas race has a little less space in it. And so that's why I use the term ethnicity. And I tend not to use the term white and black within those terms because, again, they're politically and socially constructed. I will tend to mostly talk about geographical origin and ethnicity in its wider terms and sometimes complexion, which is what people actually really want to know about. Yeah. I liked your phrase, blessed with melanin, a word I can't really say. <laughs> and also I'm blessed with none and burn just by stepping into the sun. Um, but I do like that phrase. Um, we could talk for a long time, um, but it is December and it's dark. And I think also Dr. Nubia probably wants to go home. So I really want to thank all of you for coming this evening for your amazing attention, great questions. 
and I'm sure you've got a lot to think about, because <laughs> I certainly do. Um, but if you would join me in thanking Dr. Nubia for his talk once more, that would be great.